Practice Listening Test for IELTS, Version 3. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You are going to hear a conversation. Look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Two seven seven eight five zero nine three Sports Centre. Hi, is that you, Charles? How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? Linda, I'm so glad that you phoned. How is your art study in London? Mm, fine. Everything is going on quite well. And how's your teaching? OK. The students are very good, and they're keen on the tennis lesson. Oh, did I tell you about my trip to London? Yes. When are you coming? I'm leaving tomorrow afternoon at 2. My flight number is BA207, and I will get to the Heathrow Airport at 4. Flight BA207 at 4 tomorrow. Fine. Linda, can you meet at the airport tomorrow? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I can't meet you at that time, because I have to bring my mother home from hospital. She was in the hospital for a week, and the doctor phoned me this morning. I see. It's all right. I can manage to find your place by myself. Well, Charles, my neighbour Peter Wilson has kindly offered to meet you and take you home by car. Oh, it's good. But I hope it doesn't cause you any trouble. Oh, no. Mr Wilson is a flight attendant. He works at the Heathrow Airport. I see. But I don't know him. Yeah, as you have never met him before, I shall describe him to you. That will help. Hang on a second, and I'll get a pen and a piece of paper to write them down. OK. Tell me what he looks like. He's about 37, I think, a middle-aged man. He's about 1 metre 70 centimetres tall and medium build. He has weather-beaten face with red cheeks and big nose. He has a thick beard as well as thick hair. His eyes twinkle, and he usually has a big smile. He seems to be a jolly man. So... He's one metre, seventy centimetres, and medium build. Red cheeks and a big nose. He has a thick beard and thick hair as well. I think I can recognise him. I do hope you manage to recognise Peter without any difficulty. And I'm looking forward to seeing you. Have a nice trip. Thank you, Linda. I will see you tomorrow. See you. Charles is on the plane and is talking to the passenger next to him. Hi, I'm Charles. I'm Susan Smith. This plane is very large and comfortable, too. Yes. The Boeing 747 is the largest passenger jet airline in the world. It's over 70 metres long, with a wingspan of about 60 metres wide. You can see it's capable of taking up to ten seats and two aisles. Its wide body soon earned it the name of Jumbo Jet. Oh, I see. Are you an engineer? No, I'm a teacher, but I'm interested in it. Have you ever travelled by Concorde? No. I don't like to fly, and this is my first time flying. But I have heard about that plane when I was at school. I see. Let me tell a bit about Concorde. The Anglo-French Concorde is much thinner and sleeker in appearance, with a far narrower cabin allowing only four seats across and only one aisle down the middle. In many other ways, too, the Boeing is completely different from the Concorde. The Concorde, for example, is smaller than the Boeing 747, its total length is under 26 metres. How many passengers can the Boeing 747 take? The Boeing 747? It takes up to 500 passengers. 500 passengers? That's quite a lot. And how many passengers does the Concorde take? Concorde's normal capacity is 144. The Boeing 747 has a small upstairs lounge which is for first-class use only. 
The Boeing's flight deck is also on the second floor, in front of the lounge. Both aircraft are similar in that they have four powerful engines. However, while there are two turbofan engines at the front of each of the Boeing's wings, there are two turbojet engines at the rear of each of Concorde's delta-shaped wings. That's very interesting. What's the speed of Concorde? The Concorde's great advantage is its speed. It is capable of flying long distances at supersonic speed. Its maximum cruising speed, for example, is 2,333 kilometers per hour. Compared with the Boeing 747, 978 kilometers per hour. Thus, the Concorde can half the time normally taken for journeys by the Boeing 747 and other conventional aircraft. It's very nice to hear all this. I have learned something. Oh, we're moving now. I have to buckle my seat belt. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. Charles is in London now. He goes to listen to a lecture about an introduction to Britain. Questions eleven to twenty-two are based on the lecture. Look at questions eleven to twenty-two. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 11 to 22. Britain is an island which is about the same size as New Zealand or Uganda. Australia is 60 times its size. It's just under 1,000 kilometers from north to south, and about 500 kilometers across at its widest part. The climate is temperate and changeable. Its population is about 58 million. Consisting of 48.5 million in England, 5 million in Scotland, 3 million in Wales, and 1.5 million in Northern Ireland. The majority of British people work in service industries such as trade, catering, tourism, TV, plus a wide variety of business services. About 20% work in manufacturing and 5% in construction. Then approximately 1.5%. Supply energy and water to other British citizens, while another one and a half percent are involved in agriculture, forestry, and fishing. Do-it-yourself or DIY, as it's known, is a popular leisure activity in Britain. Many people spend their weekends carrying out various improvements to their homes, such as replacing the kitchen cupboards or decorating a bedroom. Other people lovingly tend their gardens, growing shrubs, flowers, and sometimes vegetables. Half of British households keep a pet of some kind, and a quarter of the population is involved in some sort of voluntary work, helping others in their spare time without being paid for what they do. One example of volunteer work is Meals on Wheels. Volunteer drivers collect prepared lunches from a centre and deliver them in their own cars to elderly people who are unable to leave their homes easily to buy food for themselves. The recipients of Meals on Wheels pay a small charge for their service to cover the cost of the food. Britain is an individualistic society, and people are often tolerant of other people's eccentricities. One can find those with special talents or unusual hobbies interesting, amusing, and even endearing. Common topics of conversation are weather, sports, current events, and what is planned for the next weekend. Or what was done the previous one. British people have become more adventurous in their eating habits since they became a multiracial society. There are Chinese, Indian, Italian, French, and Spanish restaurants in many towns and certainly in every city. 
Food served in pubs has also become more varied in recent years. However, the traditional fish and chips are still popular and are widely available from fish and chip shops all over the place. The British diet typically includes some sweet things such as cakes, biscuits and desserts. Many people struggle with the weight problem as a result. Newspapers in Britain can be divided into two main types, popular and serious. Popular papers are physically smaller and are more sensational in their reporting of the news. They are called tabloid papers. Serious newspapers are larger and attempt to report current events in a more analytical way. They are called broadsheet papers. Each newspaper has its own political affliction or bias. The Times, for example, generally supports the Conservative Party, whereas the Daily Mirror supports the Labour Party. Compulsory education begins at the age of five and finishes at the age of 16, with some students continuing their schooling until the age of 18, when they enter some form of higher education. The exams taken at age 16 are called GCSE, short for General Certificate of Secondary Education. Students often take eight or nine subjects at the GCSE level. The exams taken by 18-year-olds are the A-level, short for Advanced Level. In general, only three subjects are studied at A-level. Divorce is becoming increasingly common in Britain nowadays, and many non-married people cohabit or live together without getting married. There is a preference for smaller families, with the average household size being about two to four people. Approximately 70% of people own or are buying their own homes. Most people live in houses rather than flats. About four out of five choose to live in houses. The stereotype of a British person is someone who is reserved, polite, private and perhaps rather cold and exclusive. This is certainly not true of all British people. In fact, many people in Britain are warm and humorous. They often laugh at themselves and try to see the funny side of life. British humour is frequently of a sarcastic kind. In sarcastic humour, mocking or ironic language is used to convey scorn or insult, but it should not be taken literally or seriously. The British person is simply pulling your leg. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a talk about the college library. Questions 23 to 32 are based on the talk. Look at questions 23 to 32. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 23 to 32. Welcome to the College Library Services. We have a well-stocked bank of resources which are in two main locations. One is the library itself with books and periodicals. The other is the Self-Access Language Centre with audio and video material. I'll start with the library as you have to pass through it in order to reach the other one. The library provides study places for about 400 readers. The books stocked number over 100,000 volumes, including bound periodicals. About 1,200 periodicals and current issues are displayed. We have two main sections for books and another for periodicals and journals. The books are in two categories, those for general loan and those for reference. General loan books are all on the first floor and they can be borrowed for three weeks by full-time students. 
Upstairs, you will see our reference section. The reference section includes current abstracts and index journals, general and special bibliographies, indexes, general English and European language encyclopedias, a complete set of British standards, substantial collections of British government publications, and sets of maps of Scotland, all in addition to other reference material of a general and specialised interest. As you know, reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances. The library tries to provide as full selection as possible of supplementary reading material. Students are expected to buy prescribed textbooks and copies of these, are usually only held in the reserve collection on the ground floor for study use, only within the library. They can't be taken out of the library. An inexpensive photocopy service is provided in the library, and facilities are available to produce enlarged copies from microforms. Other equipment available includes microfilm readers, engineering drawing boards, a light table, tape slide units, and typewriters. Prospective students will be admitted to the library during the summer vacation if the college has made a firm offer of a place and the student has accepted it. The college library will also admit pupils from local schools who are following six-year study courses. Various guides and leaflets are available to explain particular aspects of the library services and particular areas of its stock. Copies of these are freely available to anybody interested in using the college library. The library opens from 8:30 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday to Friday, and 9:30 a.m. To 12 p.m. on weekends and holidays. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You're going to hear a lecture about Franklin D. Roosevelt. Questions thirty-three to forty-one are based on the lecture. A look at questions thirty-three to forty-one. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 33 to 41. Franklin D. Roosevelt was 32nd president in America history. Franklin Roosevelt was born in 1882 at Hyde Park, New York. He attended Harvard University and Columbia Law School. In 1905, he married Eleanor Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt entered public service through politics, but as a Democrat. He won election to the New York Senate in 1910. President Wilson appointed him Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he was the Democratic nominee for Vice President in 1920. In the summer of 1921, when he was 39, he was stricken with poliomyelitis. Demonstrating indomitable courage, he fought to regain the use of his legs, particularly through swimming. Roosevelt was elected president in November 1932. When he took the presidential oath, the banking and credit system of the nation was in a state of paralysis. By March, there were 13 million unemployed, and almost every bank was closed. At the depth of the Great Depression, the new president brought an air of cheerful confidence that quickly rallied the people to his banner. Before long, the complex of reforms known as the New Deal was well on its way. He brought hope as he promised prompt, vigorous action, and asserted in his inaugural address, "The only thing we have to fear is fear itself." During the entire New Deal period, 
Despite its speed in decision and execution, public criticism was never interrupted or suspended. In fact, the New Deal brought to the individual citizen a sharp revival of interest in government, and brought recovery to business and agriculture and relief to the unemployed. With astonishing rapidity, the banks were reopened, and a policy of moderate currency inflation was adopted in order to start an upward movement in commodity prices and to afford some relief to debtors. New governmental agencies brought generous credit facilities to industry and agriculture. Savings bank deposits up to five thousand U.S. dollars were insured, and severe regulations were imposed upon the sale of securities and the stock exchanges. In agriculture, far-reaching reforms were instituted. Congress passed a more effective Farm Relief Act, providing that the government make money payments to farmers who would devote part of their land to soil conserving crops or otherwise cooperate in long-range agricultural goals. By 1940, nearly six million farmers were receiving federal subsidies under this program. New Deal efforts were carried on, generally against vehement criticism, not only from the Republican Party but often from within the Democratic Party itself. Nevertheless, in the 1936 election, Roosevelt won an even more decisive victory over his Republican opponent. Governor Alfred E. Landon of Kansas than in 1932. The 1940 presidential election yielded another majority for Roosevelt. For the first time in American history, a president was elected to a third term. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, Roosevelt directed organization of the nation's manpower and resources for global war. Feeling that the future peace of the world would depend upon relations between the United States and Russia, he devoted much thought to the planning of a United Nations, in which he hoped international difficulties could be settled. As the war drew to a close, Roosevelt's health deteriorated, and on April 12, 1945, while at Warm Springs, Georgia, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. That's the end of section four. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. This.